<laughs> it's uh, pretty amazing how you have something like the internet with information technology, which means that you would think that with so much information out there that we begin to develop a wiser, smarter, more intelligent segment of people that would be aware of how to process that information coming in. But unfortunately, the opposite has happened, is that with having lots of information, there's also, just like in any field that if you water, like if you went out, think for a moment, if you went outside and you had a yard, a large yard, and you just watered it, never took care of it, and you just let whatever happened grow there, then you begin to see, at first, maybe grass grow, but then you'd start to see some weeds grow. Then you'd see some other kinds that root themselves in, that take over and kill off grass, and wind up turning your field that you watered into something that you never intended it to be. And that's kind of what the internet does sometimes with information, is that at first you get information from the internet. It's an information source and you're able to kind of trust some of the sites that you go to. Then gradually you begin to expand your venue and you find out that there's a lot of information out there. And as you begin to look around, you begin to get too much information in, and you overload your mind with things that will not and never will lead you into a knowledge that becomes wisdom because the Holy Spirit is the one who actually teaches us things. He's the one who causes our mind to work in a godly way, in a orderly way. He is the third part of the Trinity, of the unity that God is, the Elohim, the, the oneness that God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is. And it's also the third part of what we are when we're born again of the Spirit. We're born not of the flesh and not of the soul, but of the Spirit. When we become born again, when we become like when God created Adam, when God created the universe, when God intended man to be a spiritual being existing in a physical plane. And so when you take out that part that helps us to understand information and apply it to our lives in knowledge, and then as experience comes in so that we would live it and become aware of what is real and factual, then we would become wise. But unfortunately, because of the internet, informational overload has made a lot of people who should be wise pretty foolish because they don't know to filter out the wrong from the right. And speaking as a network engineer, and I deal with the internet daily on at least 10 to 12 hour daily basis, and I watch people go after the latest buzz, or the latest ooh, ah, or picture, or sound, or idea, and they don't check the source. They don't look to see, well, where did this piece of information come from? I mean, was it paid for by, let's say, a, a profit-based orientation? Meaning like, okay, let's say a survey was done and, and somebody wanted to uh, show that, you know, Christians don't tolerate certain behaviors. And so you get a hate group to do that. And they're going to come up with a survey that has a certain numbers that looks real from their point of view. And so they'll construct a website that'll look like that. It'll look also data oriented and also factual, except for the little pieces they forget to hide and to disguise of where they came from and what they were really all about, which was to skewer the results in a certain way. Politicians do this all the time. They call them pack groups and do certain things behind the scenes that you can't see unless you're, you know, techie and then you begin to research these things and find out where they came from. But you see, we have a source. And as long as we're in touch with our source, we can know the truth and we can find the facts. And the same thing is true on the internet. 
when I go to the source code behind what you see, I can see where the person came from, where their their website was developed by, what home site they are at, or what HTML code they're using, or what code, you know, and they leave out or they forget to change information so you can see where they came from. And a lot of times knowing that code and just going into it and finding it out will tell you a lot about the site or about the information. And God left us his code, which was the Bible. He gave us the word of God so that we wouldn't be lost about being bombarded by all this information, either from the internet or from our daily living, from news sources, from television, from things that we see, like Jesus warned us that the eye, if it was full of light, how great the light would be therein. But if it was full of darkness, how great the darkness. And so he gave us a source code that we could always prove what is true according to the word of God. Because we go by the Bible from cover to cover because it is called the word of God, which is what one of the titles of Jesus is. And Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but look again, they are that which speaks of me. So the scriptures all in their source code have to point to and direct you towards Jesus himself. It is the source of truth because Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. He said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. So he's our, our source. He's our, our code. He's our, our lodestar, as it were. He's our balance. He's our, there's a little number sequence that's usually put on the end of code at the end of a, most things that are packets that are sent by data over the Internet. And, that little code, you know, is a CRC, you know, it kind of checks and makes sure that everything's all put together right. That's what Jesus is for us. He is our CRC, so to speak. He's the one that checks redundancies, you know, and makes sure that we're all right, according to his word, and not our own. Because you have to kind of get to a place where you have a personal relationship with him, or else you're always going to be running after the latest buzz, the latest information, the latest explanation that, oh, guess what? Somebody just took numbers and tore apart the Bible and found these secret numbers inside and, oh, ooh, we found out something new. Oh, really? Hmm. Did it point you to the source code or did it point you away from knowing Jesus in a personal way? You see, a lot of times people start off with this idea that they have to discover something new. And I'll give you an example of that. There was a time where people wanted to find out, you know, what Jesus was like because, you know, Jesus had become, and admittedly so, a uh, visage of, visage meaning an idea of, this blonde-haired, blue-eyed, looked like a Anglo-Saxon kind of <laughs> person who was legally set, you know, and a lot of times you'll still see pictures like that where he's got blonde hair and blue eyes and he's got this beard that looks like it's been trimmed in Roman, <laughs> or not, not even Roman, but in um, Anglo, Anglican style. And as amusing as that is, you know, the, the opposite rebellion against that went to the extreme where they started making Jesus into this Orthodox Jew where he had, you know, curlies, you know, and zitzis, you know, and they made him put on a talis and they started changing him and making him look like that he was orthodox, you know, when they didn't even have that at that time. It made him start to look like that he wore talis, you know, and that he had zitzis, you know, and that he had strapped on boxes on his head and straps on his arms. And they started saying, oh, well, it's, that's our real Jesus. That's our Yeshua. That's our Yehoshua. And because they began to discover that Yehoshua, Joshua, is the real name of Jesus, that they began to say, oh, well, you know, it can't be Joshua. It's got to be something more than that, you know. And so because it's Yeshua, maybe it's Yehoshua. So they became up with this Yahushua. So they became Yahus because they were once Yahwis, and they started 
changing the name of God into something else. They changed it from YHVH to YHWH to Yahweh because they'd seen a W in Hebrew, but that's a Shin, it's an S, and a Sin, which is an S. And so in some ways, it was kind of God's humorous way of looking at it and saying, you're kidding me, you're going to go after sin in order to make a Yahweh? <laughs> so these cult-like people started getting carried away about this name thing, and they became sacred namers, and they became naming it, you know, claiming it, and then they became all kinds of things that they started going after on the internet because they wanted to develop this whole new idea so that they could get people to follow them. So because they were techies, they got into this new interpretation. They started rapping out Hebrew and changing it to fit their way of thinking. So the Yahwehs turned Messianic into a Yahushua. So they became Yahus, which is, if you think about it, funny in the extreme, because a Yahoo is kind of a Yahoo, which is kind of like a, a hillbilly <laughs> who doesn't know much. And yet they think they're so wise with this wrong naming of God himself. And all because they wanted to interpret rather than read it. Because it's really simple. All you got to do is read. And once you do read it, all you got to do is follow it. And when you read it and you follow it, all you got to do is believe it. And when you do, God comes through. He always does, you know, and that's what amazes me about it, is that so many times people think they have to believe in something they can't see, touch, or feel. And I always say, well, two out of three is good for me. I can see, touch, and feel God, you know, so the only one I don't know is what I can't see, touch, or feel. He takes care of that part, because <laughs> obviously they would be able to prove it one way or the other. But the rest I can prove. I don't know about you. But in utmost, the supreme climb, Take now thy son, Genesis 22, 2. God's command is, take now, not presently. It is an extraordinary how we debate. We know a thing is right, but we try to find excuses for not doing it at once. To climb to the height that God shows can never be done presently, it must be done now. The sacrifice is God through in will before it is performed actually. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and went unto the place which God had told him. The wonderful simplicity of Abraham, when God spoke, he didn't confer with flesh and blood. He didn't confer with his own sympathies or his own insights. He didn't confer with anything that is not based on anything except a personal relationship to his God. These are the things that compete with and hinder obedience to God because everything else what he tried to interpret, people would have said, no, you can't take your son. No, 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 that's, that's, that's too pagan, right? Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. Personally, if someone told me they were going to go do that, I'd say, that person needs to be locked up. I said, they're crazy, you know? Matter of fact, you know, let's go call someone, you know, get that taken care of right now. And we would be right. I mean, frankly, you couldn't find someone doing that today in the same way that Abraham did it in that day. Because obviously, even as it was in Abraham's day, though it was acceptable, it would not have been the living God that he thought he believed in because he knew what child sacrifices were. But rather than disobey his personal relationship with God, he chose to obey. So he went. I wonder for you and I what we would do in that same circumstance when God challenges you in your comfort zone, and he will. Don't get me wrong. He, as much as I talked about the yahoos and the people that changed the name of God and everything else, they were at some point in time challenging their own way of thinking to know the truth. And you will be too, because God at some point in time will shake up your comfort zone, whatever you're in, unless you're used to it. <laughs> then it's kind of like, well, okay, that's easy, Lord, you know, let's do something else. But he'll shake up your comfort zone to challenge you to knowing him and trusting him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, like he did Abraham. So whatever it is that you think that God can't do, he's going to come to you and prove that he can do. Because he wants you to have a personal one-on-one -on -one with him and not with your own ideas. Because he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in thine own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. If you're doing anything less, he will put you to the test. That's just the way it is with God.
because he's not going to have anyone else in control. Not your ideas, not your theology, not even your hermeneutic or homiletic, because you think that you're so right sometimes in thinking, and I've seen it just recently where a fundamentalist pastor who supposedly was supposed to be like so right on, who's gone so many years, suddenly has gone off into this, he's not a prosperity doctrine teacher, but he's like, oh, well, you know, it's okay to be wealthy, it's okay to be rich, you know, that's just God's blessing upon you, that's an abundant life, you know, don't worry about it, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's okay, it's, it's just as easy for a rich man to enter into heaven as long as he's not wrapped up on it, you know, as it is for anyone else. Right. That's exactly what Jesus didn't say. Abraham did not choose the sacrifice. Always guard against self-chosen service for God. Self-sacrificing may be a disease. If God has made your cup sweet, drink it with grace. If he has made it bitter, drink it in communion with him. If the providential order of God for you is a hard time of difficulty, go through with it, but never choose the scene of your martyrdom. God will choose for you what he wants you to do. You don't get to pick. God chose the crucible for Abraham, and Abraham made no argument. He went steadily through it. If you are not living in touch with him, then you will not do it. It is easy to pass a crude verdict on God, but you must go through with the crucible before you have any right to the pronounce a verdict, because in that crucible or that cross that you bear, you will learn to go and know God better. God is working for his highest ends until his purpose and man's purpose become the same. Until you know God and God has brought you to that place of the end of yourself, you'll never be able to deny yourself completely because you'll always be seeking to interpret God rather than responding and obeying him as he says what he wants to do to you, maybe with you, but he's always doing it for you, even though you may not understand it at the time. So when you interpret, be careful, be very careful, because with so much information being bombarded on you, with so much interpretation being thrown at you, with so many people seemingly looking like they're knowing what they're doing, I'm going to tell you the truth, cut away all the garbage, cut away all the input, cut away everything, get alone with God one-on-one, -on -one, and go from there, because when you do, He'll take you from there to the next step and then walk each step because, oh, I may be able to give you some hints and some pointers and you know, directions and say, hey, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do first and then give you a hint about, you know, like, if you kind of feel like it's a little bit off, we'll ask for confirmation from him, not me. Don't come to me, you know, it's like, hey, it's your personal relationship, dude. But at the same time, I can share with you about we do comfort and encourage one another in lots of ways that can help us to exhort one another to know the Lord in a more intimate and personal way. But the bottom line is today, walk with him in your way as I do in mine, and he will lead us in the way that he wants us to go.